So here we are in the climactic episode 11. We've seen now the practical side of daily life in a sort of broad brush approach where it kind of ends up being a pretty simple idea. You just sit on your butt and learn Bible and then try to apply it to the rest of your day. Every day. You're doing that using 1 John 1 9 because you're constantly sinning one way or another. You're doing that under a teacher that God has appointed for you and you ask him, ask anything in my name and I'll do it. You ask him and he directs you to who that teacher is. You study under that teacher using whatever that teacher is teaching that day or if he happens to be online then God will direct you as to what lessons to pick and every day you do this and it's very routine very much how do you want to call it mundane and there doesn't seem to be very much if any relationship between what you're learning in the Bible and what you need in life. There seems to be a total disconnect. Yep, there is. Not only that, but the very rule that God is giving you. Hi, study my word and I'll bless you and your periphery and there'll be more good deeds because I'm doing them than all the world put together can do. Really? You never actually see those good deeds. I hope you know that. If God's blessing the world, the world's already busy doing the very things that it thinks will get those results. But it doesn't get those results. They don't know that. Because God's doing the blessing to make it work. So they think what they do is making it work. So you don't see that it's happening because of what you're doing. Which doesn't seem to be doing anything at all. And it doesn't even seem to be helping you. If anything, all of this seems like magic. A fantasy. Or arbitrary. And as you rock on doing this, you will have no shortage of encounters in your mind and from outsiders who when they figure out, because sooner or later it will be a confronting issue, well, you're just studying Bible? That's not helping anybody. There'll be no shortage of people complaining to you about your idea as if it weren't the Bibles. Because to them, since they can't read the Bible, this is just not possible. The Bible and humanity and all that has to be all tied up together and the definition of spirituality to them is that you run your butt off for other people and that, and God's supposed to credit that. That's what they think the Bible says. So they conveniently ignore the many passages that contradict their notions. Like, Genesis 4, where Cain slaved to make vegetables for God and God didn't accept it. Abel slew a lamb. God accepted that. It was more work what Cain did than what Abel did. In fact, Abel didn't do any work because a lamb just more or less, you just sit with it and it eats grass and it grows and the wool grows on it. You're not really doing anything except protecting it from any beasts that come around. It's a whole lot harder to grow vegetables. So Cain was pretty ticked off. His works weren't accepted. That seems kind of arbitrary, right? You go to all this trouble for God and you give him something you came went to all this trouble grew a prize crop of vegetables and presented them to god making a gift to god which god didn't accept 
After all the hard work I did for you? Yeah, but did Cain ask God what God wanted? God already showed what he wanted. Abel. Sacrificing the lamb. Cain learned how to kill Abel by watching what Abel did to the lamb. That story's in 1 John 3. And in, I want to say it's in John... 844 came, came to my mind. But I don't think it's there. Alright? Christ was talking about it. Devil, in you know, was the guy who inspired murder and Cain learned murder from watching Abel. That's what God accepted? Murder? Killing a lamb who was innocent? Versus my hard work at making vegetables? See, to the human mind, God's standards, <clears throat> that you just sit on your butt and study some book, is holy. That is offensive to the average human being. The average human being thinks that somebody should reward you for your hard work for them. Okay, but notice the incompetence. Cain didn't ask God what God wanted. Cain did what Cain wanted. And expected God to credit Cain for what Cain wanted to do. Why should God credit you for paying your light bill? God asked for something else and you didn't want to do that. You went and basically rejected what God said and went and did something else and then you expect God to be grateful? See, that's the issue here with salvation. That's the issue here in the trial. You invent something of your own that you think is a sacrifice that you expect God to credit you for. And then he doesn't? Yeah, but did you ask him what he wanted first? The answer is no. He's telling us what he wants. Hebrews eleven six. Sit on your butt, study my son. In Israel, the law was even more strict than we got. And in a way, our law is stricter because it's every day. But in their life, they had whole years where they weren't even allowed to work. They had to just study for the whole year. And every seventh day, they weren't allowed to work. They were to study. And there was a death penalty if you worked on the day you were supposed to study. So in that sense, it was more severe than we have. That's how important study was. And every Jew will tell you studying Torah is more important than anything else. But they don't do it. Okay? That's what God said. And when you want to reject the rule that somebody makes and then substitute your own idea of what they ought to want and accept from you, then when they don't accept it, you'll call them bad. You'll call them arbitrary. When you call somebody arbitrary, you're saying that their justice standard is a whim rather than based on true justice principles. Okay, but who's really being arbitrary? Cain arbitrarily decided that, well, what he wanted to do with his vegetables, God should accept. And when God didn't, Cain accused God of being unfair. So who's being arbitrary? Cain. God said what he accepted. And he replied to Cain right there in Genesis 4. The sin bearer is lying at the door of your volition. Verses mistranslated in English. The sin bearer is lying at the door of your volition. Waiting for you to say yes to God. But obviously he said no to God and invented a substitute. That was just before Cain went. And out of jealousy, because God accepted what Abel did, Cain murdered Abel. And that's the story of the human race. That's the story of what Satan's arguing. 
Satan's argument is that God is arbitrary. Why? Because Satan's saying that what Satan does and what his minions do and what his plan does for the human race is good. And God should accept it. Because it's good. So because what Satan's calling good is not something God accepts. What the human race calls good is not something God blesses or accepts then, oh, God must be unfair because God isn't doing what we say God should credit. Now, the we is Satan, the demons, all non-Christians, all Christians who are carnal because they're substituting their own ideas. They've already rejected God's or they wouldn't be carnal. And that can be any of us at any given moment. And of course, the Jews are rejecting it too. Now, bear in mind that in Judaism, you got Jews who believe in Messiah and Jews who don't. But even the Jews who believe in Messiah, for the most part, not all, for the most part, they stress works. They stress obeying the law as a post-salvation way of worshiping God. But that's not what the Bible says. They will make it be what they want the Bible to say. And Christians are no better. This is the mainstream Christianity and all the fringes do. The number one thing they all stress is works as spirituality. Doing for people as spirituality. And they slap God's name on it. And the Bible disagrees with them. There are no people in the first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and thinking. That's the upgrade that Christ put on it in Matthew. I did videos on it in my LXX playlist. You can see the, the change for yourself. He's deliberately using the LXX and he's making changes between it and the Hebrew text in the Old Testament first commandment to show the interrelationship. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and thinking. That doesn't leave any room for people. That doesn't even leave room for you. And are you going to take that commandment seriously? Because all the people who say, Oh, you should do for people. That's being a good Christian. No, it isn't. There's no people in the first commandment. And if you were to just be blunt like I'm being now, you know, in person to some other Christian, they would call you a heretic. They would call you evil and wrong, and you're not a Christian, and you're not obeying the Bible. Hello, you're quoting the first commandment to them. The first commandment is the Bible. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. The word mind has the word strength in the Old Testament. Christ upgraded it. You can love with all your strength, but not necessarily your mind. But if you're loving with all your mind, well then that's everything. All your thinking. There's no people in there. Oh, but that's wrong. Uh, excuse me, that's the Bible. Satan's looking at that first commandment. And he's saying, oh yeah, you, you, you think you're, you're telling us you're righteous and you're just. We can't even obey the first commandment. You know, I have to spend at least five minutes a day thinking about the fact that I have to pee. So Satan's dead sure that something's wrong with God. Because to him, it's not good if it's not coming from the being manufacturing out of the being's own self. Something of that self for the somebody else. That to him is true good. Of course, it's convenient for him to have that definition of good. Because he's more gorgeous than everybody else, even now. He's got more abilities than everybody else, except maybe the seraphim. I don't know 
enough about what the seraphim can do. Satan was just a cherub. That's a lower order. Which the seraphim came about after the trial ended, the first trial. So, Satan's making an argument so that he can say to himself, Well, I, I, I did better. I did really good for you. I did this all by myself. See what I did for you. Now, who's the God? This is the inherent thing that's wrong with good deeds. Is that they put all the stress on the person doing the good deed and really it's belittling to the recipient of the good deed. I did this for you. So who's being glorified? The person doing the good deed is patting himself on the back. So that's kind of arbitrary, don't you think? If you're running around doing good deeds so you can feel good about yourself, then you don't care about the recipient. You care about feeling good about yourself. So who's really being arbitrary? How just is that standard? Where's the independent justice criterion? If you're doing it to feel good about yourself, then anything you do, you will call good because it makes you feel good about yourself. Well, then where's the independent criterion of justice? What if what you're doing for the person, the person doesn't want? What if what you're doing for the person doesn't work, doesn't benefit them, actually harms them? After all the good I did for you, uh huh, Cain made vegetables for God. How stupid can you get? Does God need vegetables? No. Can anything Satan do for God? Is it, is it ever going to be something God actually needs? No. How can it? God doesn't need anything. God doesn't need Cain's vegetables. God doesn't need anything Satan can do. If God doesn't need Cain's vegetables and he doesn't need anything Satan can do, uh, what can we do? So if we sit there and say, well, I did a good deed. I should be credited by God. For what? Did you do it for God? Oh, you'll claim you did so you can feel good about yourself. But whatever it is you did, didn't do anything for God. Might have done something for your ego, but didn't do anything for God. So who's being arbitrary? Arbitrary means that you're doing something based on a whim. It's the worst crime that a person in public authority can, can commit. If you have public authority or you're a judge, something like that, you're never supposed to be arbitrary. You're always supposed to be working with rule of law and with independent justice principles, and you make your decisions based on that. That's why lawyers are so expensive, because you've got all this case law that you have to look at to make sure that the arguments you make are in line with case law. So that it isn't arbitrary. Okay, but all these Christians and Jews and everybody in every religion and Satan are all doing their works and crediting themselves and saying that what they do is good and God should credit it. For what reason? Where's the justice? A, it's not doing anything for God. So the claim is unjust that God ought to credit it. B, uh, what it's really doing for anybody else isn't competent. If anything, it's selling a whole lot of false information. It's selling God as this entity who wants you to work your butt off. So now you're libeling God or slandering him. And God's supposed to credit you for that? What kind of credit do you think you should get? Lake of Fire credit. Of course, if you believed in Christ, you can't go there. But your work sure can be burnt up. That's 1 Corinthians 3. Who's being arbitrary? We are. Satan is. 
Hi, what I do of myself, which is good. Those are two judgments he's making. A, that it's of himself, and B, that it's good. Hello, Satan wouldn't exist if God didn't make him. So that judgment number one, that he's doing it of himself, is a big fat lie. He didn't make himself, God made him. So he's not doing it of himself, even if he is doing it of himself, because every ability he's got, God gave him. Number B, he's calling what he does good. He's acting as judge, jury, and executioner. Is it really good? He's made the first mistake that he did it of himself, so his judgment is impaired. Obviously, it's arbitrary. Because it sure doesn't meet the facts. Number two, he's calling it good. He's calling it good. It's his decision that it's good. Not God's. So he's being arbitrary. And everybody in the human race, and you know, I'm no exception, at times we all say, well, I did this and it's good. Well, I didn't do it, because everything I can do, I got from God. And number two, I'm calling it good. That doesn't make it good. I'm rendering a decision that I really don't have all the facts. So you see, this whole segment, it's going to be really long too, this whole episode 11 on arbitrary has a lot of dimensions to flesh out. And it's going to be kind of windy, I'm sorry. But this is the whole heart of the trial in every human mind. We look at ourselves and accredit ourselves. This is the nature talking baby. We credit ourselves with what we do. We credit ourselves as the author. That's the first mistake we're making. The second mistake we make is we are judge what we do as good and deserving a certain credit. We can't ever really know that because we don't ever have enough facts to know that. In order to say that what you do is good, first of all, to say that you're doing it is a big lie. Even if you drive to the store, there were 600 people involved in making the car you drove. So you're really not driving to the store. You and the 600 people who helped make that car are driving to the store. You're depending on the quality of what they did for your ability to drive to the store. So you see, you're not a product of yourself ever. First of all, God's the one who authorizes you to breathe. Courtesy of him, you can do anything at all. And number two, everything you do is a product of hundreds of other people. Or you wouldn't be able to do what you're doing. You can't drive to the store. You can't go to sleep at night. Somebody made the building that you live in. Somebody makes sure that the water that you turn on the tap works. You couldn't take a bath. You couldn't eat dinner. Except that hundreds of other people were involved in producing all the things that enable you to do the thing you're doing. So, you, what you do is good? Not hardly. At best, Anything you do is a cooperative effort that just so happens everything happens to work. Yeah, and who ensures that everything works? God. Because he ain't getting nothing for it. So you can't say you're doing a good deed for him. So this whole trial is hinging on two incompetences. Number one, I did something. Oh yeah? By yourself? Not hardly. Second incompetence, I did something good. Oh, yeah? 
Do you know all the ramifications about what you did? Do you know where it's going to end up? Is the good that you think you did the good that actually occurs? Not hardly. And that's why this episode 11 is going to be so long. We're going to examine these two arguments. We're going to examine, is God really arbitrary? Two, well, what about the argument about what I do? Three, what about the argument that I'm doing a good thing? Shouldn't that be rewarded? As you can see, <laughs> episode 11 is going to be kind of involved. Peace out.